So I'm here with Nathan Cox, uh, the infamous to some of y'all. Nathan, would you give us a little bit of background uh, about yourself uh, as we get started? Yeah, sure. Uh, so my name is Nathan Cox, as Pete already said. Um, I'm, I'm actually an Army veteran. I joined the Army in 2006, and um, I kind of had a political awakening, so to speak, while I was in Iraq uh, from October of 07 to December of 08. I uh, heard about this guy behind me named Ron Paul, uh, who helped kind of cure my apathy, so to speak. Um, and uh, when I got just shortly before the end of my tour, I, I started plugging into uh, organizations like Campaign for Liberty because I wanted to, I was getting out of the Army in the summer of 2009. I wanted to kind of hit the ground running and make a better impact and difference in people's lives and, and liberty uh, versus, you know, what I realized I, w w um, I was doing the contrary kind of in the Army. Um, so, um, when I got out of, uh, the army in 2009, I got really involved, whether it was a, a few political campaigns. And then, um, I started going to events like pork fest and meeting guys like Pete and Ademo and, and other folks. And, um, I ended up, uh, I ended up launching Virginia cop block, um, as a result of me being illegally pulled over. And, um, I think that was in 2011, maybe. Uh, by a Virginia Commonwealth University police officer. Uh, he pulled me over because he didn't like something that I said, which was simply, quote unquote, stop harassing people. We pay your paychecks. He pulled me over and uh, I we got the attorney that um, I hired, which was a constitutionally minded attorney named Tom Roberts, um, who is also affil affiliated with the Rutherford Institute in Virginia. Um, he, he defended all that. Then we uh, turned around and sued the Virginia Police Department, which we actually settled out of court for 10 grand. But it was during that time period, which is when um, I launched Virginia Cop Lock, which is actually, uh, Pete, I don't know if you know this or not, but there's actually a little bit of irony behind that because uh, two reasons why I joined the Army was one, one reason was up until that time, uh, I was actually, there was a few a few years was actually trying to become a police officer myself. And I don't know if you ever knew that, Pete, but, um, you know, even even prior to my political awakening, um, I, I, I didn't have the greatest run ins with the police. And I had this idea of the type of police officer that I wanted to be, which was unlike any that I had ever met. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to be kind of on the inside um, not only uh, having an influence on, you know, people who are already in the department, but I, I wanted to be the type of police officer who was really involved in helping people in their communities and not, you know, giving out tickets and, and this, uh, this and that. Because uh, although I was politically apathetic before joining the Army, my two big gripes with the government was taxation and the police. Uh, so that's kind of me in a nutshell. Um, I don't know. If Interesting. Yeah, I didn't. I guess I didn't realize that you had uh, aspirations to go into police uh, employment yourself, as did I. And, and it sounded like we both, you know, had similar uh, motivations, but uh, just had uh, experiences that, that didn't bode so well. But uh, so yeah, I wanted to talk to you today about um, another incident you had. You mentioned the VCU incident, and when you first got connected uh, with this uh, attorney. Um, but the incident, I, I was uh, surprised. A little backstory, just you know, uh, recently I was I was uh, on some social media and I saw that you had posted uh, a campaign that uh, someone else had started, a GoFundMe campaign, uh, seeking to raise a little bit of money to pay back some legal expenses you had. And I was I was thought to myself, what what happened that you know Nathan that Nathan needs some some coin like uh, what what new incident happened and then I was reading the text and I saw wow this is related to an incident that happened years ago I couldn't believe well actually I can't believe it's it's legal land and it's pretty crazy but um, I couldn't it was surprising to me that it was still going on uh, most notably because of you know it was to me something that had already been addressed but would you give an overview of that situation the incident i'm uh, referring to and kind of just maybe like the big bullet points on on uh, how that all has unfolded thus far yeah sure absolutely and and again i really appreciate the opportunity to chat with this uh, to, uh with you about this um so it started in uh memorial day weekend in virginia uh, in 2012, um, I was coming home from a side job that Saturday, 
And, um, you know, I don't know about other states, but in Virginia on holiday weekends, it seems like the Virginia State Police is just all over the interstates trying to issue as many citations as possible. And that's, you know, honestly, on the way home, it was about a 20 minute drive from where I was to on home. And I, I honestly, no exaggeration, saw uh, at least a dozen or a dozen and a half cops. And um, I was just about two miles from my exit. And there was a traffic stop that, for whatever reason, they felt that they needed like four or five cop cars for one, you know, traffic stop. And when I passed that traffic uh, stop on Interstate 295, for whatever reason, um, a cop ended up pulling out and following me. And uh, long story short, it was a trooper. Trooper Melanie McKinney pulled me over for two non-moving violations. Uh, one, my inspection sticker had expired. The other was, um, oh, my front license plate was not visible. I didn't have it attached to my car, although I did have it in my car kind of on my dashboard. Hmm. So she pulls me over. And, um, you know, of course, I'm in the habit of recording the police like we advocate to do. Um, and so I, I'm, you know, when she's pulling me over, I'm, I'm in the process of, you know, getting my things together, uh, my wallet, I'm getting my phone ready to record and all this stuff. And, um, so, um, and at the time I had a civic, you know, it, it had a lot of political type of bumper stickers. It had a big veterans for on Paul decal. So, um, anyway, she pulls me over and immediately demands that I get out of the car and get out of the car. Please. Why are you asking me to get out of my car? Because you've been doing something. I was getting my wallet out of my center console. Step out. And I felt was very aggressive towards me. And in fact, I had described it in pre previous interviews or whatever or writings that it was the second most aggressive traffic stop that I had ever been in. And uh, so she opens the door, tells me to get out. So I'm, you know, there's two videos online one is my cell phone view the other is actually her dashboard camera which i acquired and um so she's getting out i'm i'm trying to record her and for the first couple minutes um you know she's actually trying to swat the phone from me so she's much shorter than i am so i'm holding the phone over her head so she can't reach it and she she you know from one one side of her mouth she's saying oh your cell phone could be a gun please put it down while on the other side of her mouth, when I was trying to say, listen, it's a cell phone, I'm recording you. She's like, oh, you can record me. Um, just let me pat you down. So you're like, there's double speed coming from what she was saying. So long story short, I ended up complying, which I sort of regret. But I ended up putting my cell phone down against my spoiler at the time, which was facing her cruiser. Because I thought that we were going to be interacting in between our vehicles. So I ended up doing that, and that was after, you know, that was, uh, and you, you'll see this in the video for anybody watching, that was after, you know, she literally made contact with me several times trying to get the phone for me to stop recording. So I um, ended up turning into like a literal, uh, like 28 or 29 minute traffic stop. She had about three, maybe four state mm -hmm. troopers guarding on the side of the road while, um, while uh, she wrote the tickets. When she walked back to her car, I didn't see this when it happened, but she actually took my phone and laid it face down on my trunk so it would no longer record. And I didn't see her do that, but at one point while I'm trying to talk, you know, because I use that 30-minute traffic stop as an opportunity to communicate our ideas to these troopers who are guarding me. Um, and I ended up noticing by looking that my phone was somehow laying flat down. I, I was actually at one point begging them, hey, let me get my property. It was like 100 degrees that day. I was afraid my phone would get damaged. I said, you know, what if it does get damaged? Who's going to be responsible for this? Right. So long story short, um, I dealt with these two non-moving violations. I got one of them dismissed. Then I filed the Freedom of Information Act request, which is how I got the dashboard camera and some other electronic forms of communication, some text messages and some other stuff. And in her own dashboard camera, she tells her colleague that she knew it wasn't a gun, uh, that she just didn't want to be on YouTube or whatever. So she, still, she had no problem violating my First Amendment right to record her because she didn't want to be online. 
Um, so uh, it was all about two years after, you know, that was all said and done. You know, that was in the past. And then all of a sudden, two years after that, the next thing I know, I'm getting a summons for uh, a lawsuit in civil, uh, small claims court in the county that I lived in for defamation. And it turns out it was from this trooper, Trooper Melanie McKinney. So she had like, I don't know, there was like 12 or 18 claims that I supposedly said that were defamatory. And, you know, I'm a Christian. I'm not in the habit of making slanderous or defamatory statements against anyone. I knew I had done nothing wrong. A number of attorneys, you know, that were Facebook friends of mine, uh, along with paralegals, looked at her filing and, you know, they thought it was a joke and frivolous. And um, so I, you know, I showed up to that court date. Um, I had a paralegal there and an attorney on the side to give me any advice uh, who were there doing it pro bono. And um, she ended up not showing up. She claimed that she thought it was in the afternoon. So uh, as a result, the case got dismissed, of course. And and then she I, I think she ended up filing an appeal because she wanted to push this thing. And when she did that, it went to the higher court uh, circuit court. That's when I lawyered up with um, the same gentleman or firm who had already represented me in two prior First Amendment cases, one of which was the one I've already referenced, the VCU police incident. And um, so uh, he, you know, he was going to represent me. She got an attorney and it went from a five thousand dollar suit to a one point three five million dollar suit, a twenty seven thousand percent increase. Which is, which is just absurd in and of itself. So unfortunately, the case dragged on for like two, maybe two and a half years, close to three years. And um, there were several hearings, several discoveries. And as, and as a result of all that, you know, my legal bill got to what it is now, which is around 94000 uh, The first hearing, which I can't even remember the date now, but the first hearing they had they got most of the claims dismissed off the bat. Actually, most of them, all of them, but one, if I remember correctly. And um, but all the while they were trying to get these discoveries to build up their case more and more. And um, so the last claim against me, I think they just dealt with this past November, which is something that I said when I was invited to speak um at uh the university of richmond a uh, group of law students they want they want they invited me in to talk about virginia cop lock and what it was all about so and i published that video on the virginia cop lock youtube channel and uh i had said something like quote unquote um uh she pretty much assaulted me or whatever which is no way defamatory these claims were just bogus uh so that was dismissed um, and then the most recent hearing, which was maybe four or five weeks back, was actually to try to get some of my legal fees compensated. Mm -hmm. uh, because there's two ways to go about doing that. There's one, you can countersue, uh, which I'll talk about that here in a second. And then there's the other one is filing sanctions against, uh, I guess, maybe her or her attorney, however that works in legal land. And for whatever reason... Uh, at that hearing, there was a brand new judge, um, and um, and as a result, I think we just kind of lost that, you know, front to uh, uh, beginning to end kind of aspect of the case. We kind of lost that continuity, in, in my opinion, and um, and you know, I, I can only really expect that so much from this injustice system to begin with. I was very thankful that I was vindicated because I knew I didn't get anything wrong. But as you know, you know, now I'm, I'm dealing with this legal bill and, you know, so. Yeah, not to mention the, the years of your time and, and uh, energy that you've had to put towards uh, just um, uh, trying to speak truth to these uh, ridiculous claims and, and whatnot. So what, what was the motivation, do you think, for this uh, Melanie McKinney? I mean, why, why a second suit? Why? I mean, it, I've seen her, her quotes of saying like, Hey, I'm not a tyrant or whatever. She's like, I'm not one of these bad officers. I I want to help people, but you know, it seems like um, subjecting you to this uh, legal land situation for these these number of years and like uh, and claiming that she was so harmed that she's due over a million dollars seems pretty far fetched to me. Um, have, did you ever have any interaction with her? Like, 
I guess, in passing and in, in legal land proceedings or just elsewhere? Is she still employed, to your knowledge, in, in that capacity? Or? Uh, to my knowledge, she is still employed. I, and I, I am somewhat familiar. I do recall some of those quotes that she said as far as, you know, she's not a tyrant or whatever. But, you know, when after my incident, uh, several times on on uh, through the Virginia Cop Block Facebook channel, I asked if anybody had ever been pulled over by her. Uh, uh, and whatever the experience was to reach out to us. And we had a handful of people that also had very bad experiences with her. Hmm. Um, and one of the things I was really hoping to retrieve from this case, because I couldn't do it as a citizen, I was hoping to do it by way of discovery, was um, you know a, a complete list of complaints against her. Because uh, unfortunately, that type of information, at least in Virginia is uh, protected under the Freedom of Information Act request, which is pretty backwards in my opinion. If you have a police officer out there who has a history of misconduct or complaints or bad behavior, that should be available to the public uh, for obvious reasons. Um, they're a public, you know, for some reason, or for, if a police officer has a number of those things, in my opinion, that's a safety concern or a public safety concern, and people should be, uh, have the right to know about that. Uh, so I was hoping to get information like that, but I didn't. As far as if I've had any communication with her, um, I will tell you that, um, you know, I don't know, it might have been, it was, uh, I think it was just before it went to circuit court and maybe just after I had sent her a couple of emails uh, basically saying, hey, listen, I don't know why you're mad at me. Um, I have not, done nothing wrong. Um, I told her, you know, I would like to, you know, just settle this as adult civilly. Um, you know, outside of court, um, I even went so far to tell her that I was praying for her, for her safety while she was on the job and so on and so forth. Uh, but I never once got a response. Um, you know, I, I don't even know if you know this, people. We actually, um, I'm near, I'm almost certain, I can't confirm this, but I'm almost certain that um, not only her, but I was reached out by the Judge Judy show. They wanted our case on their show. And from what the producer told me, she and again, this is what the producer told me. She agreed to supposedly be on the show um, and they were going to, you know, they were going to pay whoever lost. They would pay that five thousand. They were going to pay, you know, an appearance fee to us. Everything was going to be covered. Um, but the reason why I, I didn't want to do that was because I know Judge Judy is not a real judge. She's a private arbiter, which means she can make any decision and not be held accountable for it. Um, and this boiled down to my First Amendment rights, and I, don't want, I didn't want that to be a mockery of it on TV. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, those are the reasons why I didn't take it to Judge Judy. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, hopefully that, that answers your question as far as my dialogue with her and, and stuff like that. Yeah, certainly. So you did a lot of things to me right that day. You know, you filmed and you were very, like, uh, calm and you, and you weren't uh, aggressive. You weren't... Uh, you know, and, and after the fact, too, you did lots of follow up. You did a, a Freedom of Information Act request. You got all that electronic data that you talked about and communications. And you've been very you were very transparent. And through this whole thing, I guess, is there anything um, in retrospect that that uh, that you wish maybe would have unfolded a little differently? Any lessons learned? Now, that's a great question. I, in fact, I don't think I've been asked that question. Um, you know, I I. Um, uh, like I said earlier, um, I sort of regretted putting my phone down. And, I, you know, I in retrospect, I might not have complied because, you know, I knew my phone wasn't a gun. Um, I, I, I felt um, at that time and really still do that that was an absurd notion uh, because she continued to say that, you know, it, she acknowledged that I was recording. She even said I could record. Mm -hmm. But then she kept on saying it could be a gun. So, um, you know, I kind of regret putting the phone down because obviously people like you and I understand the importance of that objective record by way of a video documentation. Um, but other than that, uh, and this was back in 20, I, 2012, right? So this was like well before, uh, apps like cell 411, uh, or maybe even maybe even bamboozer. I know Quick existed at the time, but not much else. Did you record to yeah. your phone directly, and then you were able to maintain possession of your phone after the incident? Yeah, yeah. I, I and I, I know at one point you were w using was it Quick? Is that how you pronounce it? Yep. 
Yeah, I, I, um, I, and I was using that too. Um, but no, but yeah, to answer your question, I was. It was a hard copy to my phone, which I uh, obviously did retain, and uh, it ended up being put online. Nice. Um, so, but yeah, I uh, of course I'm, and I'm sure you would agree that if you have the opportunity to stream live, that's probably the best way to go because that way, if your phone does get confiscated, the video is already out there. Plus, if a cop knows that you're streaming live and have an audience, they might think a little bit more twice, so to speak, uh, about you know violating you or victimizing you. Perhaps if if they know that there's they, they got even more eyes than just your eyes on them, so to speak. Certainly. Well, what message do you have? I know, so, you know, you were a, a former, um, you know, uh, uh, in the military, you were, um, you've uh, put, to my knowledge, uh, a great deal of energy and effort to uh, try to share ideas that are based on peace and uh, consensual interactions with lots of folks, you know, um, taking, uh, spearheading a, a big project called the Liberty Empowerment Project in the Richmond area and, uh, putting a billboard up and all, all sorts of things. Uh, jury nullification has been a big drive of yours as well. I guess I, I just mentioned these things because um, like what, what message would you have for any police employees that are watching? I, I mean, it's easy to, I think, have a knee jerk reaction, like to look on like a, to say, Oh, this guy has been to legal land a number of times. He's had to lawyer up a number of times. He must be doing something wrong. But I would say, you know, it's in fact a complete opposite. And would you have any uh, statements to any police employees that might be watching that uh, to to try to uh, maybe bridge that um, what they might have is like a knee jerk reaction to where you actually are coming from? Yeah, um, you know, I, I actually have uh, uh, friends that are police officers and, um, you know, I, I don't make um, I don't make generalized statements against police officers. Obviously, people like you and I understand where their income comes from, uh, which I'm I'm not really trying to expound on. But you know, obviously, there's some uh, there's some police officers who um, um, who uh, are more, I guess you could say, damaging to the public than others, um, or reactive to the public than others. But um, you know, I personally, um, I I don't hate the police. I I really dislike what they do to people quite often when people are victimized, most especially when it's uh, violence that's really manifested, whether it's, you know, outright abuse or whatever. Um, but, um, you know, something that you and I have talked about in the past is, you know, uh, um, having non-abrasive communication towards the police, because whether it's my neighbor or somebody uh, that I assemble with at, at a local church or whether it's the police, you know, people like you and I, we want to spread our ideas and our values and our principles to people. And we're certainly not going to do that effectively to a police officer if we're being disrespectful or derogatory or using um, certain types of language uh, towards them or whatever. Um, I, um, you know, I, uh, I just try to use opportunities to, uh, to talk to police officers if I'm in a situation, you know, to, to share with them my ideas about about things. Most cops, like, we're huge, um, like, I believe the government's taken away a lot of our rights, which is ridiculous. So if, if folks are familiar, if they were following this, this, uh, all these iterations of the late, of this legal land situation, which has now left you with some, um, a little bit of, of coin owed to the firm that, uh, helped you out, uh, if they've followed the whole trajectory or if they're just learning of it now and, and maybe I'll, I'll put links in the video description uh, that they can uh, get more up to speed um, if they want more detail based from what you said but how, how can folks help like, help you address that now where should they go and, and what could they do yeah uh, great questions and I, I'll start off by saying you know I, I have had a few critics if you want to call them that uh, say you know why? What? You know? Why do you have this bill? Why can't you counter sue or this, that, and the other? And I'll just kind of answer that real quick first, because I know that's going to come to people's mind. Is counter suing at, at this point? It, uh, we feel is just not advantageous, right? I'm already ninety four thousand dollars in the hole as a result of this case going on for almost three years, as a result of multiple hearings, court appearances, discoveries, which takes time. That's why the bill's so high. 
And if we were to try to counter sue, um, that would, you know, they would have to spend more time, which means more money to build that case. And then, of course, uh, in this criminal justice system, we're not guaranteed any outcome that would be beneficial for me. So that's why we've deemed counter suing as not advantageous. And like I said earlier in this conversation, we did um, we did have a, a handful of very solid and justifiable reasons that when my attorneys filed sanctions against her or her attorney, however that works, to recoup some of that cost or a good amount of that cost. But like I said earlier, um, you know, that that for about five or six weeks ago, whatever that hearing was, for whatever reason, there was a new judge and that judge, uh, you know, wasn't quite up to speed, in my opinion, because it was a brand new judge, you know, she whatever. And uh, she just decided to shoot all of our stuff down. And that's why I wasn't awarded any any funds. So um, as far as donating, um, my like you said earlier, my attorney did start a, a GoFundMe campaign. If you got on GoFundMe, you could probably just search like Nathan Cox or I think he called it uh, Constitutional Liberties Matter is the title of it. So if you Googled or um, searched one of those on um Go fund me, you'll find it, but I know you're going to put the uh, the link in the description. Um, I've also told people that um, you know they, they do, of course, had that fee, uh, a commission fee or whatever. So for if anybody wanted to get around that, they could PayPal me directly because uh, I do send in monthly payments to my attorney. It's not like I'm asking people to pay and I'm not paying anything. Of course, I would never do that. So uh, for people who already have sent me money by way of my PayPal. I liquidate that every month and include that into my payment, uh, which is something I just did yesterday. Um, and I've also, for, for anybody who insists on donating in Bitcoin, um, I do have an address, um, which that to me, uh, I'll honestly say that's a little bit inconvenient for me, but for people out there who absolutely insist, that is another avenue that you can donate on. And, so and, PayPal. Uh, and what is your PayPal address, Nathan? Uh, my PayPal address is nate, N-A-T-E, 5176 at gmail.com. You know, I'll just say that, um, you know, I hope situations like what I've been involved in with this uh, officer or state trooper that we've been discussing and even other uh, incidents I've been involved in, uh, primarily First Amendment related incidents, I hope things like this doesn't deter people uh, from getting involved and getting activated because, you know, I know to some degree it does. Uh, people don't want to be, the last thing that people, people want is to be retaliated against, against people like the police. But, you know, don't let that be a deterrence. You know, it literally, one person literally can make a difference in this world. And one person can have a tremendous amount of impact in your own community, whether it's handing out literature door to door, like I've done, whether it's handing out literature in front of courthouses, um, whether it's, you know, taking opportunities to speak to groups of people about the principles of liberty, about the ideas of personal responsibility and accountability and stuff like that. So don't, you know, don't don't let your fears get in the way of, um, you know, of, of making things happen and trying to make a difference. That's that's probably the last thing I'll finish on. Right on. Couldn't uh, couldn't finish on a better note myself. I appreciate your time, Nathan Cox, and your efforts.